fortunate to have with us today the president and publisher of the Gazette, Mr. Dan Stever, who is going to uh, give a presentation talking a little bit about the past, present, and future of the Gazette and newspapering in general. I've also asked if he would also talk a bit about his journey as to how he be ended up becoming a, a newspaper publisher. And then finally, he'll take some questions after the presentation. Mr. Stever uh, is a graduate of the University of Virginia where he uh, earned a degree in mechanical engineering. He uh, uh, then embarked on a career in business, spending about 30 years. Uh, 20 of those is a, a uh, executive and was the CEO of a number of, of uh, firms. A lot of them are related to marketing. Uh, at this time, I'm very pleased to uh, present to you and to extend a warm welcome to the president and publisher of the Gazette, Mr. Dan Stever. Thank you. Glad to be here today and, and see all of you. I don't know if any of you were at the open house last night. Uh, there's somebody in the back that was there. We had a, uh, an open house last night. It was, it was in, the invitation was in the newspapers to all subscribers, and we invited all, all the advertisers, and we just opened our doors um, pretty wide open. And we had some displays and some, we had cooking de demonstrations by Teresa Farney, and we had Dave Ramsey talking about sports, and we had Joe Hyde, our editor, um, holding actual news planning sessions of how we meet every day and decide what's going in the newspaper. So it was a great event, but I, I mention that because um, it, it, was a, it was not just an open house, but it was a, um, an outward display of who we are at the New Gazette. We, 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 we moved downtown so we could be in the middle of everything, not hidden away someplace. We have glass, we're in the first floor, we have glass all around us so anybody can walk by and see us. Because we are an integral part of the fabric of this community and have been for 141, almost 142 years. Um, and so being available, being transparent, having people see how the news made, there's no secrets. Um, is really important to us at this stage of our development. And, and uh, last night was our first kind of pulling down the covers and saying, come on in and watch what we do, ask any questions you want. And it was, it was a wonderful evening. We had, I think we had uh, 90 RSVPs and the last count I heard last night, over 400 people uh, came in. So it was well attended and, and, uh, and I think everybody had, some, had, had a good time. And, and learn something, as, as, but, but, but nobody learned any more than we did. Um, and that's, again, part of who we are as, as a newspaper right now, is that we are a learning organization and we listen to the people of the community, to our readers and subscribers, and, and to our business partners in the community, um, which is a little bit of a change from what I am told uh, from the Gazette of the past in, 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 in some recent years. Um, but uh, so anyway, if you were there last night, I'm sure you had a good time because uh, we, we sure did and, and it, was, it, was, it was a wonderful event. Okay, I'm gonna take about two minutes to tell you a little bit about myself because I'm here to talk about uh, the icon, which is the Gazette. Uh, somebody, a couple people, we, as I was coming in, we talked about there was an ad in the go section of the paper Friday for this event and it had my picture on it, which I did not know that they were going to put it on. The editor came in and said, Did you, oh, we, we goofed up, we put your picture in the paper without telling you that, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, I've asked them not to do, but the way it was positioned with my picture in this icon event, I said, no, it's not me, it's the Gazette. I just represent the Gazette as the icon. Um, but a little bit about me and how did I get here? Because um, as you just heard, I have a BS in mechanical engineering. So obviously my career has had multiple phases to it. First one started uh, working in plants uh, manufacturing facilities as an engineer. Uh, I didn't design things. I didn't do a lot of calculations. My forte in engineering was the management side, the people side. And uh, I moved from that into sales and marketing and then started a career mostly focused on consumer product companies 
in marketing services companies who serve consumer product companies. And consumer product companies mostly in, in, the, in the world that I came from was your food manufacturers, your Kraft and Kellogg's and Quaker Oats and all those companies that make food. Um, I was also in consumer software <clears throat> where I was in a software business back in the 90s that made consumer software, things like the print shop, which was one of the first CD-ROM titles that had printing on your desktop. We had educational software, like Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, and Reader Rabbit, and those kind of, 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 game, of titles. It was a very wholesome company. We made great software, but it was a consumer product. And that leads me to the newspaper business. This is my first endeavor in the newspaper business. So my first day on the job at the Gazette, I was introduced and they all said, well, how do you know anything about the newspaper business? You, I said, I made, my first joke was, went over okay, was that, well, when I was 11 years old, I was a newspaper boy. So, so I know what they look like, I know how to fold them and I know how to throw them. But uh, from that though, I, I talked a lot about consumer products. Fundamentally, it is, is my, my belief that the newspaper is a consumer product. What do I mean by that? It is a product that we have to do such a good job of making on a daily basis that the consumer, you all, would like to buy it. Now, what does it provide to you, the consumer, that would make you want to buy it? Well, hopefully it provides you with some information, education, entertainment, and it basically helps to, we think holistically about the newspapers as something that should enrich lives. It should make lives more enjoyable, more better, I mean, I mean better, um, easier to live. Uh, we should provide news, information, and services that help make lives better. And, and here's the most important, and the community better. <coughs> so that is something that we talk about a lot at the Gazette right now. So I came here um, actually to do a project for a friend was going to stay about 60 days and ended up staying till now. I'm, I'm here now about 17 months. And the project was to sell the Gazette. So last two years ago, the Gazette was owned for about four months by a company who bought the rest of what was Freedom Communications. And they had intended from the start to sell off all the assets except for the Orange County Register. And I was asked to come out here and help them with that process. And my wife and I came out here, we were empty nesters for our first time in our life, and three things happened during my project. One is that we woke up every morning and looked up at that mountain and said, wow, this is, this is pretty neat. We moved here from Boston, which is, we, neither of us are from Boston, but we had been living there uh, for about 12 and a half years raising our four children. And uh, we moved out here, first time empty nesters, looking up at that mountain and said, this is, this is pretty neat out here. I mean, we moved in such a hurry that the, the, the laundry wasn't done, the dish, we didn't pack anything because we thought we were going to be back eight, nine, ten weeks later. So we liked the area when we moved here, number one. Number two, my first time doing the job of publisher, there's, there's really two parts of the publisher job. One is the business, running the business side. And the other side is being out in the community and being that face in the community that's involved, um, is active, is gathering and listening to the community, not just for what we can write in the paper, but how we can help the community better. And it was something that, to my surprise, and never having done it before, I, I enjoyed a lot. And the third thing that happened to those 60 days is we started to get engaged with the, the group that was going to become the new owner and is now the owner of the Gazette. And as I met those people and learned about them, I learned that they weren't buying this newspaper for financial reasons. They were buying it because they loved the community and they wanted to see the community succeed and do well. And they had a fundamental belief, which I subscribe to as well, and that a community and their daily newspaper are, are integral, integrally uh, entwined in this way. A community can be aided and enabled and helped to become better by a local newspaper. And if that community gets better, the local newspaper will grow and get better too. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the local newspaper and the community. Uh, and when I heard that that's what, how they felt and I felt the same way, uh, they asked me to stay and I said I hadn't come here to do that, but yes, I'll stay. And here it is 17 months later and my wife and I are very happy we decided to stay. 
So the icon, that's the Gazette. Uh, I mentioned 1872. It's, it's one of the oldest entities in, in, in Colorado Springs. The Gazette was started before there was a fire department, before there was a police department, um, before there was almost anything here, the Gazette was started. And it was started by Palmer. So the founder started the paper before a lot of the other things we had even grown up around, around the area. Um, it's so old that one of the early breaking news in the first few years, one of the breaking news stories was Colorado statehood. That was breaking news that, that the uh, Gazette helped to break uh, the story on back then. Um, so the Gazette has a rich tradition, and I've, we spend a lot of time on history and tradition at the Gazette because of our own history, but because of the rich history of our area here. I don't know how many of you read the paper and look at A2, second page every day, when we talk about who we are. And we are getting such tremendous feedback uh, on, the, on that page. It's not it's the old pictures, but the old stories, the Ask General Palmer that we do once in a while. Um, so we have a lot of people back there that, are, that really relish the community we serve and are very interested and entwined with uh, uh, the historical aspects of the paper. So we started a long time ago. And over the years, for good or for bad, the Gazette has been there reporting the stories and having an influence in the community. Sometimes a good influence, sometimes not so good of an influence, but it's throughout the years been, been a major part of the, the, of the newspaper, um, of the community. I want to tell you two other kind of historic facts. So talk about influence. I think I asked uh, one of our historians the other day, so what do you think one of the most influential things that the Gazette did in its history was? And he talked about the 1920s. And in the 1920s, the Colorado governor's office, the, the Senate, the, the Congress was all controlled by the Ku Klux Klan. And they had, and, and they, their influence was more Denver-centric. And it wasn't really, they hadn't influenced the Springs too much yet. And they made a concerted effort. We are running the state. Colorado Springs must be, become more friendly to the Ku Klux Klan. And they started to place people down here to try to turn the tide in Colorado Springs, which was more anti-Klan at the time. And the Gazette was the only one that, that stood up and said, no, not in our town. And they wrote editorials, and they did reporting, and they broke stories about the atrocities that were being committed just to our north. And they stood firm to the point where one night, the, the plant, which was downtown here at that time on Te Tejon Street, the plant was surrounded by Klansmen with, with torches and they were going to burn the building down. And the editor at the time came out and said, no, you won't. The police were called. There was this confrontation. They stood their grounds. And they drew the line in the sand and said, we are not going to be controlled by the Ku Klux Klan down here. And not only did we, did we stand up for Colorado Springs, but it turned the tide in the state. And within a year or two, uh, the control of, that the Klan had over the state was, 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 was no, no more. And it was because the Gazette stood up and said no. So, Coming, and the fellow, by the way, the historian that I asked is about a 36-year-old guy. And so he's really into the history. He told me that story. And I felt like that's a good example of an iconic organization who almost 100 years ago now um, did something of that nature and, and really defended the city, so to speak, at the time. Um, a final thing I'll mention to you is that the Gazette has a, has a history of standing up for, for strong beliefs. In the 60s, there was a reporter named Vi Murphy. And Vi um, did a story, and uh, it involved criminal activity. And she had a, an unnamed source, and she refused to reveal her source. And she was pressed by the courts, and pressed by the courts, and she was a mother of four. And she went to jail for 30 days because she said, I'm not going to give up my source. My newsroom supports me, my community supports me, and the courts will do with, with me what they may, but I am not going to reveal my source, and she didn't. And 30 days later, she was freed, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great day in the history for us in the Gazette because privacy and, re, and, and doing the right thing and uncovering stories uh, is part of the heritage of the Gazette and all newspaper organizations, but that's an example of another one of those defining moments in the Gazette's history. So um, I talked about inform, educate, entertain, 
and sometimes maybe influence um, is what are part of our mission. I talked about the new Gazette. So I got here about eight, 17 months ago and I went around town and I said, tell me about the Gazette and how we're doing. And they were very tough meetings. Because apparently, just a few years ago, the Gazette was not known as a, as a community-friendly organization. Uh, the feedback that I had gotten at the time that the stories seemed to be written uh, out of vengeance or vindictiveness or what we call the gotcha journalism and there was no purpose behind it. People said, well, why are you doing these things? And the why is indeed a great question because the why gets to what, who do you think you are, what do you, what do you stand for, and what do you want to become? So I want to make sure you know who we want to become in this phase of the Gazette's history. We put out a, a special section a few weeks ago. It's kind of commemorating our move. There was a lot of good data and information there, but right square in the front, our mission. And this is something that since I've been here, we've, we've, we've worked on, we talked about, and we finally came up with it. And um, this is what we talk about and why we get up in the morning. It says the Gazette will be known as a progressive media company that is best in the state at providing news, information, analysis, subject matter expertise, and services that enrich the lives of subscribers and advertisers. Here's an important part. By doing this, we will help make our community a better place to live, work, and conduct business. So this 142-year-old company that's been called Out West, it was called the Gazette Telegraph, it's been called the Gazette, and there's one or two small iterations, the Daily, early on it was the Daily Gazette, the Weekly Gazette. It's been called a lot of things. Um, trying to do the right thing to help the community has always been around, sometimes emphasized more than other times, but I can assure you now, that's the mission statement. Helping the community is part of, is, is, is at front and, front and center for how we are conducting ourselves. Now, sometimes we wake up in the morning and something terrible happens and we have to report it. But we always want to report the news, particularly the investigative stuff and anything that might be controversial, within the back of our minds the, issue, the idea of is this something that if exposed, if talked about, if reported on can help better the community, not the other way around. By reporting a story it makes the, con it tears down the community, but is, is it something that if we fix that issue it will make the community better? And if it is, then even if it's a tough story to tell, we're going to tell it. Um, Since, since starting 18 months ago, one of the things we focused on was um, the paper itself, making it thicker, better, covering more topics. Um, that's something that's going to continue because we, we need to reflect what the interests of the community are. And that's where you all come in. I look around today and I say, I, I'm guessing a lot of you are, are readers of the Gazette. And you are an important part of us making that paper through your feedback. As I was coming in today, someone in the back said, hey, um, I've got something for you here. It's an article I've written. And could you take a look at it or have some people take a look at it and give me feedback? And that's music to my ears. There's a lot of talented writers probably in this group here today. People that have minds that can analyze an issue, offer an opinion on it, offer a viewpoint or subject matter expertise in something that is worth sharing with others. So I would encourage all of you that anytime you have something that you'd like to write about, special interests, something you think others in the community would like to know about, please submit that to us. And you can submit it to me. My name's in the paper. My phone number's in the paper. Um, my email is very simple. It's dan.stever at gazette.com and submit them. We can't publish everything and sometimes we like it and we'll get back to you and say, hey, we need to shorten this or change this a little bit. Not to change your information, but just to try to make it more compact usually or something that the editors might say, hey, this would read a little bit better. But I encourage you all, if you have a special interest, 
or point of view to submit something to us because we'd like to have that in. By the way, reader generated stories, when we look at what people read, it's one of the higher things that are read because people like to read things that their neighbors have written. And so reader generated input is an important thing. So I'd encourage you all to, uh, to sharpen your pencils if you want, if you like, if it's a hobby or a passion of yours or you have a subject that's, that's passionate. Uh, of passion to you, please, please submit the information. Um, when I when I was getting ready to come over here and talk to you today, I I, I just wanted to make sure I understood what the who, the who the audience was and what the subject matter was, and I'm going to go back to the word icon because it's a symbol. You know, at, at the end of the day, the definition there's a couple definitions of icon, but a lot of them revolve around a symbol for something something that's widely known as a symbol for, symbol for something. And, and we think about this at the Gazette a lot. We think about what are we known for and how do people view us. And what I want to tell you right now is how we want to be viewed. We want to be viewed as a, a community asset, something that makes the community better. Because the Gazette is here, the community is better. And in order to be that, we have to de deliver the the goods, so to speak. We have to do our job. And again, our job it revolves around reporting news that's interesting and relevant, that can educate, inform, enlighten, or spur dialogue. One of the things we introduced last May was something called community conversations. And we've had five community conversations so far. A community conversation is a topic is usually given to us by the community. Hey, here's something that's important to the community. You guys should lead a diet, not lead in terms of uh, uh, offering an opinion, but, but uh, initiate, enable, facilitate a dialogue within the community, if you will. And we started this last year. We've had five of these community conversations so far. The first one was on homelessness in Colorado Springs. And what we do when we have a community conversations is for weeks in advance, we'll write stories, different stories about that issue. We'll do some op-ed page work, offering some views on the issue. And then it all leads up to a big live event. Now, four of the five live events so far have been at Armstrong Hall over at Colorado College. But we've done the homeless the homeless issue in Colorado Springs. We've done the airport and how do we make our airport more vibrant and useful for the community. Um, we did one on economic development in downtown. Um, and, we, and we just did one the other day on um, mental illness. We had one the other day over at Colorado College about two weeks ago, I think, for, on mental illness. Uh, 250 people attended live. And there's a panel and there's Q&A and then afterwards, there's a facilitated dialogue around small tables by Food for Thought, one of our partners. And uh, we're really proud of the um, community conversations. And, and the reason why we're proud of it is because we think it's our, one of our duties and the duty of an iconic organization to help impact and influence and help uh, a community. Um, so these community conversations, if you see them come up, uh, we always put lots of ads in the paper to advertise them. They're great opportunities to engage in a subject matter that might be of interest to you. And they may not all be of interest to you, but there'll be some of them I'm sure that will be. Um, so you're going to be seeing more of them coming out in, in, over time. We hope to do five or six of these a year. And we'll probably start moving the venue around a little bit. But um, um, having a community conversation, facilitating dialogue so that people can come together in civil discourse um, is uh, important to us. We think that's one of those uh, one of those other responsibilities of the newspaper uh, as a an iconic organization within a community. I mentioned civil discourse. So we've also been lately on a on a kind of a a real focus and push to create more civil discourse in the online world. Um, reader habits change over time, and I can tell you that. You know, when people ask me, well, is the newspaper circulation, you know, how's that doing? Well, no, it's not what it was 10 years ago. And it's never going to be what it was 10 years ago. But readership of the content that we produce has never been higher. Not even close. Gazette.com is now accessed 
every month by 1.3 million unique visitors. That means individual people. You say, well, how, how can that be? There's only 625,000 people in the Pikes Peak region. Well, people are all around the state are reading, reading us. People from out of the state are reading us. They read us for things like our military coverage, some of our investigative work. If there's obviously, unfortunately, we, we've been dealing in this community with fires and floods, and people from outside of our community want to get the news about that, so they come to gazette.com. So readership of the content that we produce has never been higher. When you hear about the icon over here and how it's shrinking and no one reads the newspaper anymore, we don't really use the word newspaper too much. We talk about content because that content goes into the printed newspaper, it goes into gazette.com, it goes into our web app, it goes into <coughs> newsletters that we send out. So we are distributing the news in a lot of different ways. But the idea that people aren't reading the news anymore is just simply our data says untrue because there hasn't been more people reading more Gazette content ever in the history of the newspaper. It's just that a lot of it's now read online. So it's a personal preference. Our aim is to give people the, the content that they want, when they want it, and how they want to read it. So we don't care if you like to read it by the newspaper, or on your phone, or on your tablet for, these, for some of the younger people. But we don't care how you want to read it. It's, it's, but we need to be able to provide you that information to keep you connected to the community. Because at the end of the day, we view ourselves as a big connector. We're trying to connect people to the city hall. We're trying to keep connect people to businesses and how what they're doing. We're trying to connect people to our military installations. We're trying to connect people to each other online through through blogs and social media. Uh, but we we view ourselves as a primary connector for all the stakeholders, if you will, of Colorado Springs. And a stakeholder would be a citizen, somebody who works here, a business who locates here. Uh, even some of the tourists that come in are stakeholders. They have a vested interest in Colorado Springs succeeding. And we view ourselves as somebody that, need, as, as an organization that has to bring those people together to connect them together. Um, so there's been a lot of changes at the Gazette over the last year, but the, the fundamental principle of what we do remains the same. Uh, the issue of we need to provide content that people not just enjoy, but they really need and want to have to help their lives uh, is, at the, is at the core of what we do. We move downtown, as I said before, as, a, as not just a, uh, a business decision. It's, it's a nicer office and it's more efficient and all those kind of things, but as a symbol that we are part of the community and we want to be right in the middle of it. Um, and so uh, that, that was the reason for our move. We produce more news than we ever did before in this edition. It'll tell you that um, we the, the number of pages we produced in the last year went up 25% from the year prior, um, or 22%, I think, and over 20% more pages, uh, we, a lot more special sections of special interest. Um, and a lot of, we're, we're investing in a lot of reporting now that we haven't done before, like uh, we have someone going to Afghanistan in two weeks to embed for two weeks in Afghanistan. And she'll be writing from Afghanistan what it's like over there now. Uh, we had two people go to Sochi for the, for, the, for the winter games. Mark Rise, our photographer, is one of the best photographers uh, of any sort in, in the United States. He is recognized by his peers all over the country. His photos get picked up in national publications weekly. And he was there, it was his seventh Olympic Games, or eighth, I can't remember. And Dave Bradley, our sports columnist, he was there as well. So we had five people go to the, to the Super Bowl, and not to bring up a sore topic, but yeah, we had five people go to the Super Bowl. So we're, we're back on our, up on our toes, uh, aggressively investing in the news and trying to grow the content uh, for, for our citizenry. So your feedback on how we're doing is, uh, is essential. I think if you're going to be an icon in a, in, a, in a community, you need to be approachable. You need to be humble. Uh, you need to be friendly to do business with. And we're not perfect all the time, and we're not all those things all the time. But that's what we're striving to be. Um, 
friendly is one of the one of the things we talk about being right now to the, in the community friendly to the community friendly to the reader friendly to the advertiser easy to do business with so if you hear that and say geez last time I had a, an interaction with the Gazette for subscribers or a bill or a delivery issue it wasn't so friendly it's not our intent we're trying to change this and we we're making progress but we've got we've got a ways to go I also want to say that at the end of the day an, in, an organization um, can only be as good as the people that it has within the four walls and we've made a lot of changes at the Gazette in some key positions in the last 12 months um, but I'm really happy to say that a lot of the people that are actually writing the paper every day are the same paper that were people that were here a few years back they just didn't have the right vision and mission and leadership for what the paper was going to be they didn't have an owner that said your first mission is to make a great newspaper. In fact, for a few years before 2000, December 2012, the owner was a bank. And a bank owned the paper for about three years. And uh, banks aren't good owners of businesses. They only know one thing, and that's money. So they would manage a business like that, and it would be all about money, costs, and revenues. And those things are important in any business. But we have truly a double bottom line at the Gazette. Um, very intentionally by our owner who says you have two bottom lines the, the, the business bottom line that's the second one the first bottom line is the quality of the service you deliver for the community so that's kind of who we are and where we're going I, I left a lot of time to make, I, I'm imagining there's gonna be a lot of questions today and so I wanted to leave a whole lot of time for questions and I think those questions might lead into some other areas of, of, of discussion that uh, uh, I could provide a lot of, lot of information around. But I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions because every time I'm out with a group like you, I leave too little time for questions and, and, it, and it ends up being uh, we run over or we can't answer all the questions. So uh, I only wanted to give you a little bit of a preview today in, in the remarks section, but leave some time for questions. So hopefully some of you have some questions that we could answer. Um, so I'll, at this point in time, Des, I just want to open it up for questions. Yeah. The question was, could we have kept the printing in, Den in here versus moving it to Denver? And, and the answer is not responsibly. And what I mean by that is, you can do anything, depending on wh wh where you want to spend money. And we want to spend money in reporting and people that are producing news and content. And, and those presses were really very old, and we had to do something. And it was either going to be buy new ones or have someone else do the printing for us. Newspapers of our size throughout the United States, less than one in four, less than one in four today actually print their own newspaper. So this has been something that's been going on in the newspaper business for 20 years. You need to be a printer of more than just newspapers. You need to print circulars and flyers and advertisements to keep the presses running because the, the, we only run those presses when we do, do the newspaper for about three hours. And presses are so expensive that you need to keep them running 24 hours. So we didn't want to get into the printing business. We wanted to get deeper into the news business. So we could have, but we would have not been able to produce as thick of a paper, as many reporters, as many journalists, uh, and as many other things as we're going to be doing. We just couldn't have done both. And we chose to focus on the content, not the presses. Now, I will tell you that because of more reporters, more people doing online. The actual number of employees we have right now is about 15, le around 15, 14 people less than the day I walked in. And we, the printing operation, I don't know if you remember reading about it, but we, we, we told everybody how many people were affected. There were 53 people affected with the printing operation. But we're only down 14 people right now from where we were before. So a lot of those positions have, we, we are, they're no longer there as a printer, they're over there as someone who's doing, has a beat, is writing articles, is producing copy, is uh, curating stories from around the world, uh, that put it on the internet, on gazette.com, and we have some positions open right now, so I'd say by the end of this year we will almost be back to those levels of employment before the printing went away. So those jobs are just different jobs today. 
Yes. Question is logistics. How does this all work? How, first of all, how you put it all together, and then how do you get it printed up there and get it down here? So I'll give you that that right now. The um, it, I'll tell you, it's, it's me being the first time in the newsroom. It's magic. I mean, it's 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 amazing how many things have to go right and get coordinated in in, in, in any night. Um, so there's long term planning for long term stories, and then there's short term. And I'd say m most of what we do is short term. You know, two or two days, three days or less. And, and, and over 50% of it's what's happening that day. So it starts um, usually two days out where the, there's, a, there's two meetings a day. So in a newsroom, there's two, two meetings a day. There's a morning meeting and an afternoon meeting where the editors all get together, um, including the page layout people. They all get together at 10 a.m. in the morning. Or 10, they, we, that's actually 10.30 now. 10.30 in the morning, they start talking about what's going to be in the paper today and the next day. They just look two days. Um, now, the t so when you get to the following day, you've already talked about that day a little bit. So there's, there's two planning meetings a day, and they all sit around and they come and the sport says, I need this many pages this week because I got an Air Force game, I've got a CC game, and, and they, I need this many pages. And business is saying, I need to, I, if this is going on. It's gonna, so it's, there's a planning, the first thing to say is there's a planning process, it's routinized, it's every day, happens at the same time, what should go in the paper. Today's world is different because it's not just a paper anymore. It's online. So we are not just a, you know, the old newspaper business was you ramp up during the day until about 9, 10 o'clock at night. It's, it's very active in the newsroom before deadlines are done. And then you go to sleep. And you go back and you do it the next day. And it's not so anymore. Those, there's, a, there's a little bit of a spike, but it's not as big because we are doing news 24 hours a day because if we catch something like the story you're referring to, we put it up right away online. So we break more of the news these days online. And then we follow up with the in-depth reporting in the paper. And if there's any follow-up to do after that first day, if it's, if it's a lot of follow-up, we'll write another story in the paper. If it's just a little bit of follow-up, we'll do it online. So they have to work together. So a lot of planning. A good example is the, is the uh, story that you just mentioned, Trader Joe's. So we're walking around the newsroom. We have 400 people in the newsroom last night for an open house. And we're walking around, and Rich Layden, who's, who's very secretive about what he's working on, he's not going to tell too many what he's got, he pulls my arm. He goes, hey, Dan. Said, yeah, he goes, just got, just got information. So Rich has been working. Trader Joe's it was almost it's two and a half years ago when they announced that they were going to put their first store in the state of Colorado. And of course, Rich Layden, two and a half years ago, was on the phone to their PR people in California. When are you coming to Colorado Springs? When are you coming to Colorado Springs? Well, we don't have any plans. And he's been calling them every three months. Are you coming to Colorado Springs? No. They announced their second store in, in Denver. Are you coming to Colorado Springs? No. So he, for two and a half years, this guy has developed a relationship with the PR person for Trader Joe's in California. And she calls him yesterday in the middle of the, of the open house. He says, Rich, we just signed a lease. I'm not calling anybody but you. <laughs> That's a good reporter. He stayed on that story to break, that, to break what you saw today for two and a half years. Also, with, the, with, the, with, the, with that personal, uh, and, and, and now for the, the newspaper's position of, we want new things. You know, this is good news. So when he would call her, he would not just call her and say, hey, you're thinking about opening up a store in Colorado Springs? He'd say, you guys are missing the boat down. I, saw, I heard him six months ago on the, on the telephone to, to uh, Trader Joe's. He said, why aren't you coming to Colorado Springs? We've got better places than Denver to, go, to, to, to open up a new store down here. You should be, and he started would tell him, you should go to this area, you should go to that area, you should go to that area, you should be in Colorado Springs. So he was so proud. He pulled my arm and said, Dan. We just got the news. I said, what are you going to do? He said, we're putting it online. And they were actually, and there were people starting to look because you could tell something because the editor was there reading the story and he was there. And we want all these people around and he didn't want anybody to know. So we, a couple of people were just kind of standing around the desk like this and trying to give Rich some breathing room so he could break his story. And he broke it online yesterday. What time did it come out? Probably 6.30, 6, 6 or 6.30 because we were all right there in the middle of this open house. And then, of course, the, the big story with the in-depth hits this morning in the paper. So that's an example of breaking news. We, unfortunately, we, had, we, broke, a, we broke the news um, 
two hours ago about the fire. There's a big fire going on in an apartment house right now. Three alarm fire in Colorado Springs. So breaking news is part of it. Things come up, you jump on it. If the, if, 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 if the first thing you're going to do these days is get it online. Sometimes it's that breaking news. You know, I don't know how many of you, but we have a breaking news. If you're subscribed to the app, which you can get at the Apple store, it's really easy, it's free. You download a, the Gazette story. So I get a lot of mine here. Um, and if you're a subscriber to the app, it doesn't cost any money, um, you get our breaking news alerts. So you could be just be walking around and say, oh, what happened? And the, in fact, the, 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 the apartment fire just came out a few, a few, about 30 minutes ago, the fire, or an hour ago, the fire one came out. So breaking news is part of it. Planning process, but then breaking news trumps everything. So at the last minute, if something breaks at 7 o'clock, they'll be switching around the paper. Um, quickly, on the second part of your, so it's, it's an ongoing process, and it involves integrating the news across multiple platforms, internet and the paper itself. Um, one thing about this, this business that I learned, just this little sidebar to your first question, is that we get calls from people that, that are in stories. Um, all the time saying, why didn't you say this in that story? I said that. And we say, well, we said that the last story. So a story has, may have multiple articles. Waldo Canyon Fire. We were writing stories about the Waldo Canyon Fire a year after this, the, this fire. And I'll, I'll, I won't forget, I'll never forget when the, when the Waldo Canyon Fire report came out. We got a call from some people that were in the report and said, why didn't you say this and why didn't you say it? We said, well, we did say that three months ago. We can't put everything in every article. So a story might be one, one article or it might be, in the case of Waldo Canyon Fire, thousands and thousands of inches of news copy over the period of a, a year. So to your point about how do you decide, there's a lot of follow-up that has to get done in some of these stories. You have to stay on things to see what the resolution was. Are they gonna change, is the story gonna be changed? So follow-up is really essential to make sure we get the full thing right. Um, printing, so our, our deadlines are the same now that they were when we owned the printing presses. So the news, the news people have to get done in the can, I'm all done, they have the same time as they did before we printed up there. So we didn't change our deadlines. Um, but everything's electronic these days too. In the old days, you know, they'd run things up from the upstairs to the downstairs, and now we push a button and electronic files get, get transmitted to Denver, and that's how they do it. Um, the, but the paper itself, we get off the floor about 10.30, 11 o'clock at the latest, sometimes if we stretch it at night, and we're pretty much done. By, by 10.30, 11 o'clock, we're, we're pencils down, no more writing. Goes to Denver. But if you think about that, if they get their, if they get the electronic files, then they have to, they have to on their end do a few things electronically, um, to, 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 to format things. That gets done about 11, and they're shooting up there to be on press by about 12:15 a.m. They're they're shooting to be on the press. Press is running. And if you know anything about printing, the first 30 minutes of the, the process to print is the hardest because they're, they're trying to get the color right and trying to get a registration right and so they have to produce good copy. And they're hoping to get good copy done by 1230. They're hoping to have the first, uh, the first um, um, truck off the docks by about 1.15 a.m. That gets down here then about 2.30, 2.40 to our distribution centers. We have two distribution centers, one kind of on the north side of town and one on the south side of town. And they, the, the, the north side gets theirs first at, at 1.15, 1.30, uh, uh, sometimes 1.45, and then um, the second one usually comes about 2.30. So if we get everything in-house by 2.30, uh, unless we have a carrier issue, um, papers aren't going to be late. And by not late, we, we try to get everything delivered by 6 o'clock, 6.15 at the latest. Um, but, uh, you know, and if, if there's weather, so everybody asked me last night, a lot of people asked me, but what about the weather coming from down from Denver? Well, yeah, it's an issue. But we manage it this way. First of all, we had looked, before we did all this, we did a lot of study, traffic studies and everything. And in the seven years prior to us making the switch, 
The monument pass was only closed at that time of the night three times. At that time of the night three times. So we thought, well, that's not too bad over seven years. So it's closed once at the times the trucks were coming down since we've been here, but they then turn around and go back up and they come, they, they try to go, I think they go back east and come down that way if they have to. And they had to do it one time. Um, but some nights, if we know the weather's gonna be bad, we'll, we'll ask the newsroom to finish up half an hour early. We'll ask Denver to, to get up on press instead of by 12.15, can you get up on press by 11.45? Because we know that the travel time. Um, I think the worst we had this winter was that um, they got behind the snow. It was, it was a bad night, they had a couple things break, but whether it be their press or our press, things happen in mechanical mach machinery like that. So yeah, they had a little bit of a hiccup with their machines, and then they got behind the snow plows on I-25. You know, three abreast coming down I-25, and they got behind them, and that was a problem. That became a problem for us. But we haven't had too many hiccups, um, but, um, but it's, it's a tight process, though. It, it really is. But it's, it's magic to see all this come together, and every morning there it is. <laughs> So the question is, what's the change between, for, for me personally, moving from here from the Boston? Well, the first big change for me has nothing to do with where I live. It has to do with, as I said earlier, it's my wife and I now. So after raising four children, as some of you know, that, that's a big change. Um, but it was, it's, it's great for us because it ties into what do we notice. We notice there's so many things to do. We can jump in our car and we can be up in the mountains, we can be down there, down to see the river. I mean, I have some things for the spring. I want to ride, I want to, I want to do a raft trip this spring down the Arkansas River, so I want to do that. I want to go fishing. I'm a fisherman. I started trout fishing when I was six years old, and I haven't been trout fishing since I've been out here. So Paul Klee, who's our Broncos columnist, by the way, Paul Klee just won a national award for, for his work covering the Broncos for us. Um, he's an unbelievable fisherman. He knows every stream, every pond, every lake, and they catches them. They, they tell me he catches fish everywhere he goes, so I'm going fishing with him this spring. So for us, we get, we're a lot more out active and outdoors uh, more often here. Um, second thing for us, and this is a little unique to the job, is that you know, raising four kids, you, is people would say to me, what do you do after, after you go home from work? I said, what do you mean? I mean four kids. <laughs> I'm a parent for the rest of the time and that's what I do. I work and I'm a parent. But now that the parenting is less, not gone, but, but a little, little less, um, we get out more and more active and in the publisher's job, staying out in the community, we get to a lot of events. So whether it be a charitable fundraiser or things like that, something at the Air Force Academy or some, you know, wherever it might be, a, a, a CC hockey game. So we get out a lot and do more than we've ever done as a married couple. Um, and we love it. We find that this community is a very active community. Um, people like to, there's a very, uh, there, there's, a, there's a spirit of let's go explore. I think that's maybe the Western thing, let's go explore this place. So we're doing that, we're exploring. Uh, I, I like to ski, I'm a skier. Uh, I have a, we have a son who's been up and was a freshman up in Boulder this year. And he skis, so he and I get together on weekends and we ski. Um, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we say we we're more active both socially and um, physically than we've ever been. Uh, and I think that's probably a reflection of the community and the things that the, the, the region has, has to offer. Uh, one of the things about this community that I, I am just astounded at is the compassion in this community. And, and I don't know where it started or how it got to here, but you know there's more 501c3 charitable organizations per capita in this city than any city in the United States. Um, people are very engaged and involved with helping others, and uh, we, we love that about this community. Obviously, the military influence in this community, community is very high. It's, it's, people are very much supportive, more than I've ever been in any other community of the military. Um, so we like it. Uh, we, we decided to stay because it seemed like a great place to, to, to spend our next phase of our of life. Uh, so we've liked we've enjoyed it a lot. All right. Well listen, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. Loved it. I'd love to share the anything, all these kind of things. I like to get out and talk about the Gazette, but um, I like to as much answer your questions so you can get to know us better and know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, 
And at the end of the day, our success and the success of the community are, are completely intertwined. So uh, we want to see this community succeed. Thank you. Thank you.